um, my name is Maya, and um, I developed anorexia when I was 16, and I'm here sort of just to give you um, a bit of an idea of what it feels like uh, to have an eating disorder and why, why you behave the way you do when you're so terrified to eat. Um, as I said, I developed anorexia when I was 16, and for me it was, first I just wanted to lose a little bit of weight, maybe three, four kilos, and I had done, I had tried to do that many times before, and I really only lasted about two weeks. But um, this time something happened, and uh, I remember the first time, uh, the first time I started just feeling quite guilty um, when I ate breakfast in the morning, and then I just thought about it all day. Um, uh, at school and it just became more and more intense so I just started cutting out more and more food, doing more and more exercise until maybe four or five months later I was main, probably eating maybe two or three carrots a day and exercising about three hours a day, very intense exercise. So um, I was going downhill very, very fast. Um, and uh, I think the first the first thing that I, I, I'd, I'd like to explain is maybe um, why on the outside there's there's a lot of aggression towards um, carers, parents, and and also the clinicians and professionals. And um, I also attend um, a support group for parents. And this is, I think, the, one of the key issues that I, I try to help parents understand and also clinicians is that um, the, the aggression I think stems from the fact that. You basically have two choices um, when it comes to having um, anorexia, especially, which is um, what my experience is. Either you 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 um, you eat and and deal with the the guilt, which is completely uh, undescribable. It's it's like inner hysteria. It's it's just you know a thousand, a million times worse than anything you could imagine. Um, it's really just quite unbearable. I always used to tell my parents that I, I rather that you whip me until I'm bleeding than, than force me to eat. It's just that, that terrible. So that's your first option. The other option is not to eat and you know and all the things that go with it, losing weight, feeling weak physically um, and all those things. And, and you, you basically each time you just want to choose the second because that's a lot easier. And your parents, all the other people in your life want to make you choose the other option. So you, you feel this anger towards them because it's like they want to make you suffer. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's um, sort of a, something to, to remind yourselves of in order to help you remain patient and, and all those things that you need to be as, as, as a clinician working with um, people with eat, an eating disorder. And I think that um, also it's, it's important to understand that um, the overwhelming um, emotion that then uh, is created is, is just fear. First, it, it becomes. First, it sort of it starts with confusion because you don't know what, what are these feelings of guilt. Or, you know, you don't know where they come from. Um, but by the time you realize, the fear is so intense that it's it's basically extremely hard to to reverse it. Um, in terms of approach, and also another thing is that it's very difficult to be honest when you have this intense fear, not only honest with yourself, but also with others about how are you feeling and so on. Um, approaches that were useful to me, um, the first thing, as I think uh, uh, the first speakers have said, is um, empathy and non-judgment. Um, being affectionate, warm, um, compassionate, all these things are, are just, just key um, because anything else is just interpreted as, you know, you're, you're, you're a bad person and um, you should feel even more guilty. So it's sort of like putting on top another layer of, of guilt. Um, so that, that's, that's the key, but how do you achieve this? And I think that um, there's a few, thing, few things maybe to keep in mind is first understand that it's not a choice. I know you've probably heard this many times before, but when you when you um, when you realize that uh, all pleasure is gone from life, it's not only in relation to food, but there's nothing, nothing because food is just your focus. You you, you know you don't social, you hardly socialize. Um, nothing else matters. You're just completely narrowly focused on 
on food and nothing pleasurable to do with food, just completely fear. Um, so there's no pleasure in life. Um, so definitely it's not logical that it could be a choice. And, and, and when you think that some girls, you know, they're, they're in hospital, they, they're told that they will die if they don't start eating and they still don't. So it's, it's completely irrational that somebody could think that it's a choice. Um, it's important to see past the anger and the manipulation yeah, and understand that it stems from fear. It's very important to avoid making the sufferer feel guilty um, and the way to do this is distinguish between the person and the illness and um, yeah, I think that that's also important then when you're working in, in therapy and in counselling. Um, I, I found that extremely helpful to distinguish between who Maya is and keep that memory of, of who Maya was before the illness and then see the illness as something external that I just needed to push away again. And also, sort of for me, logically, the, the, uh, to keep in mind that um, always keep keep that image of what I used to be like and the fact that I, I came here to where where I, I was when I was really down um, and that means that logically I have I have to be able to go back as well so that was also sort of something comforting to think about um, uh, I think that uh, yeah it's that's something that I did find helpful is just to, to keep re reminded that to keep myself um, reminded that um, I could go backwards um, and not to think about all the time that I've lost um, that that was sort of a path to going backwards as well um, uh, I think uh, that when you when you're um, trying to teach somebody to eat again um, something to keep in mind and this really depends on on how long the person has been ill for but the longer you are you are ill the less um you can feel the sort of the natural things like hunger and and so on so you you basically 100 per, uh, percent of your decisions in relation to food are made with your mind not with your body and so it's very difficult to um to feel that when you when you sort of have especially foods that you you haven't had for a long time. You f you're so terrified of losing control and just going and eating and eating and eating and not being able to stop. So it's it's. I think it's very important to have those external sort of um, structures in place, and um, that's why I think um, uh, you mentioned that this the the current sufferers in, in in your ward said that sometimes. It felt like that for me as well, that when you go into hospital, it's almost like a relief. You don't really admit it to anyone um, because you're quite angry usually about going into hospital. But, but it is quite a relief because it's very, um, you know, it's sort of like you can, you can just, just sort of um, not battle with your own thoughts for a little while because all the control is taken away from you. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's... Um, something that's really important because if you give even a little bit of decision making to the sufferer in the beginning you know they, they will um, sort of regress and go backwards because the, the, the illness is just too strong um, just a, a few uh, I think that the key method that I personally found helpful when I, when I wanted to eat is um, there's a, the, the, you really need to inspire the person I think that um, rather than always focusing on the food, especially when it comes to that moment when you're going to eat, to, to focus on the food and, and the conversation to be completely around the food is, is, is really difficult um, because it just brings up all, all the fear, the anxiety. What I found really helpful is to shift, to shift my thinking and even um, just for a moment, and, and the way that, that I, 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 I did this or people helped me to do it, was to focus on all the things that I used to love before before I, I became ill, um, and and also to focus on the future about all the things that I would gain one, once I was I was well, um, and uh, also sort of no threats, no sort of um, panic or um, sort of, uh, those sorts of um, that sort of atmosphere. It's it's that negative atmosphere. It's it's really not very helpful and. With focusing on on the future and the bigger picture about all the things that you lo loved in your life before, it's it it really does shift your your thinking and and um, makes you 
able to sort of step back and see, okay, what am I doing this for, rather than focusing on the anxiety of this is a you know piece of bread in front of me and I have to eat it. When you see about all you have to gain, sort of it just lifts you. And 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 it's it's. I mean, I found that by far the most useful method of of trying to eat. And I think just finally, I just want to end with a with a quote um, from a, a really a wonderful book that I, I read. Um, it's called Sensing the Self um, by Sheila Rindahl, and um, she really explores the, the underlying emotional and psychological issues of having an eating disorder. And at the end of the book, this is, this is the, the, the last paragraph of the book, I came to understand that I was moved less by their pain than by their courage, their dignity, their, their dignity and the nobility of their struggle to know themselves to accept themselves and to live their lives with a fullness of spirit. That recovering is difficult was not news to me, but my respect for the strength and bravery it requires is all the greater for having heard these stories. Thank you. Thank you I'm quite guilty um, when I ate breakfast in the morning and then I just thought about it all day. Um, uh, at school and it just became more and more intense so I just started cutting out more and more food, doing more and more exercise until maybe four or five months later I was main, probably eating maybe two or three. Okay, um, my name is Maya and um, I developed anorexia when I was 16 and I'm here sort of just to give you um, a bit of an idea of what it feels like uh, to have an eating disorder and why, why you behave the way you do when you're so terrified to eat. Um, as I said, I developed anorexia when I was 16, and for me it was, first I just wanted to lose a little bit of weight, maybe three, four kilos, and I had done, I had tried to do that many times before, and I really only lasted about two weeks. But um, this time something happened, and uh, I remember the first time, uh, the first time I started just filling carrots a day and exercising about three hours a day, very intense exercise. So um, I was going downhill very, very fast. Um, and uh, I think the first the first thing that I, I I'd, I'd like to explain is maybe um, why on the outside there's there's a lot of aggression towards um, carers, parents, and and also the clinicians and professionals. And um, I also attend um, a support group for parents, and this is I think the, one of the key issues that I, I try to help parents understand and also clinicians is that um, the, the aggression I think stems. From